In today's video, I have 10 watercolour sky tips that you really need to know. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle. On this channel, you'll find everything to help you with watercolour painting, as well as a little bit of mixed media, some colour mixing, even some business and social media training for artists. So please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell notification, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. So out here in the real world where it's actually raining very heavily at the moment on the roof of my studio, so apologies if you can hear that. Out here in the real world, I've been teaching real life classes. I've been teaching students for nearly 20 years now. Don't even want to think about how old I am now. I've been teaching them to paint all sorts of watercolors, including skies. Now on this channel, I will give you some longer sky tutorials. We'll do some soft clouds, we'll do some sunsets. Do let me know in the comments what sort of sky tutorials you would like. But today I'm just going to give you 10 really quick tips. They're really basic things that you can do and they're going to massively improve your sky painting. So let's get on with them. So tip number one for painting better skies is bigger brushes. And by bigger brushes, I don't mean bigger brushes. I mean bigger brushes, great big brushes like this. You want to be using as big a brush as you can manage to wield for the size of the paper that you are using. Brush nearly rolled off the desk there. Put the brush back. Okay, so you want to use a really large brush. And the reasons for this, there are many reasons, but the main reason is that a small brush just doesn't hold much water. So what happens is it takes you longer to apply it. The paint dries quicker because the brush is hitting the paper at, uh, you know, it's got much less wetness in it. So it's hitting the paper a little bit drier. The paint's drying quickly. It's taking you longer to apply the paint over the big area that you need to apply the paint in. Parts of the uh, the sky are drying. I know you've um, you've heard this before. You've seen it in your own paintings. And then you get loads and loads of little brush marks. So I want you to use as large a brush as you can possibly manage for the size of paper you're working on. And I actually keep one of these large flat brushes for applying water. Now this brush here is very special simply because I never use it for paint. I always keep it completely clean. And then I know that if I need to pre-wet my paper for adding my skies, I'm never gonna get some strange little bit of bright green or pink appear in my sky if I don't want it there. So I do suggest you keep one of those. You want to be using um, at least brushes like this, size 10, size 12, and I've got this one here. I think it's, uh, I think it's a size 20. Massive brush, really, really useful if I'm working in a big area. I've even seen people use decorator brushes. Nothing wrong with doing that, but do check that the bristles aren't loose because they can tend to come out a bit more than artist brushes. So that's your first tip. Always, always for skies, big brushes. Tip number two, once you're using your very big brushes, I want you to work faster. There is nothing that will ruin a sky quicker than being too slow at applying the paint. I have spent 20 minutes before now just planning my sky again, all the colors I need, getting all the brushes right, getting the paper ready. You know, it's all stretched paper, I'm all ready to go. I've got my brushes, I've got my clean water, I've got something to blot the, what the, uh, the brushes if I need it. I have got everything there, all the colors are squeezed out of the tube. Don't be the person that applies the water to their sky like they do in my art classes and then they're saying, um, which colour shall I use? I, I can't get the lid off this. Don't do it. Make sure that you're completely ready to go. However long you spend planning your sky, you should be spending probably a maximum of a minute and a half applying the layer of the sky and then stopping. Just apply it quickly and then stop. You have to have even water levels unless you want a load of drying lines. And if you apply slowly, then some of the paint's gonna be drying. You're gonna get uneven water levels and your sky is gonna end up in a mess. So. Take a while to plan your sky, get everything out so that you're completely ready to go. Don't answer the phone, don't answer the doorbell, apply your sky quickly. And when I say a minute and a half, I'm talking about a country like England. If it is extremely hot where you live or in the two days of summer that we have here when it gets up to about 40 degrees, you can take that minute and a half down to 30 seconds, apply your paint really, really fast and leave it alone. Tip number three, and I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record for this one, but for goodness sake, stretch your paper. It's particularly important when you're working with skies because you're gonna put a lot of water on the paper, at least if you're doing them properly, you're gonna put a lot of water on the paper, so you don't need the paper to crinkle. Now, it's a kind of a, um, a misunderstanding that people think that stretch paper just stops you getting a horrible wiggly um, painting at the end of the day, but what it actually does is it helps you to paint as well because the more the paper buckles, the more the paint is going to sit in puddles and sit in dips. 
the more the paint sits in dips, the more you have uneven water levels, then you have uneven drying, and then you get drying lines in your sky. If you are one of these absolutely stubborn people that refuses to stretch their paper, then just use the thickest paper that you can possibly find and tape it down. Or you can use a watercolour block. None of it is as good as stretching your paper. It's really, really easy and simple. I'll put a video link up above so you can see how easy it is to stretch your paper. And it's cheaper too, because if you do have to buy that very, very thick paper, it's going to cost you a lot more money than buying slightly thinner paper and just stretching your paper. And although it will still buckle a little bit while you're applying large amounts of water, it won't be anywhere near as bad as it would have been if you were working on unstretched paper. It's going to help you so much to get a smoother finish in your skies. So tip number four is to work in layers. So I've told you to use a big brush and I've told you to apply in about a minute and a half and you're thinking, but my sky's really complex. You know, I've got a sunset, I've got yellows, I've got pinks, I've got blues, I've got clouds, I've got cloud shadows. So what I'm saying to you here is that you apply your paint quickly and leave it alone and then you apply another layer when it's dry. Now this is how you do a professional sky that's got lots and lots of detail in. I'll put some pictures up of sunsets that I've done so you can see um, how, how effective it can be if you work in layers. Now, because I said to you that you mustn't let your paint dry, you know, you mustn't have uneven water levels, you've got to apply it really quickly. Obviously, it's going to be really, really tough for you if you've got a lot going on in your sky. So just take it one step at a time. If you're doing a sunset, just apply the pink. Let it dry. Rewet the sky, apply some blue. Let it dry. Rewet the sky, apply some cloud shadow. Let it dry. I have done this multiple, multiple times. Now, it is possible to rewet just an area, like inside a cloud, for instance, and work on that. But it's difficult, it's dodgy, it's dangerous. You can get drying lines just from clean water. So, if you're a beginner, if you're at all worried about it, then always rewet the whole of the sky. And then you can apply your paint in layers and build up those more graduated techniques without just spending ages working on the same sky and ending up with a ton of drying lines and a ton of brush marks. Now before we carry on with the rest of the tips, can I ask you really quickly just to click the like button. Not only does it tell the YouTube algorithm that this is a good video, it also means that they'll show you my videos more often as well and what could be bad about that. So if you can click the like button, if you can comment or if you can share the video with other people that might find it useful, I'll be super, super grateful because it helps my little channel to grow. Tip number five is don't do this. Don't get paper and blot your painting. So it's a good idea to have some paper on the side, some kitchen paper. Um, we call it kitchen paper in the UK, but it might be called paper towel where you are, um, or rags, whatever it is that you use while you're painting. It's good to have those to dry your brush in, but for goodness sake, keep them off of your work. If you are in the habit of blotting out clouds with, uh, with paper tissue, I just don't think it's very effective. It doesn't look very cloud-like. I do like that technique for foliage and other things, but I just am not keen on it in skies. I think it looks very artificial. I can always see when somebody's blotted out their skies. And worse than that, when you end up with just puddles of, of paint and water and you just start randomly blotting your paper, there's no way of blotting your paper with, you know, even with a sponge without leaving a mark. So what you want to do instead is clean your brush, semi-dry your brush on the rag, and then you place your brush on the paper and it will lift up um, the paint like a little vacuum cleaner. It will suck up the excess paint and the excess water. You can just sweep along, suck up the excess paint and the water from your board with the brush. Now, it's possible with the brush to leave a mark as well. So if you've got an area that you really want to remain pristine, but there's just too much water in it, get a, uh, a damper, a dry brush, and just dot, just tiny little press your brush tiny little times into that puddle and it will just lift up the excess moisture and you won't get all the marks that happen with prodding your board with the, uh, with the tissue paper. And I notice in my own classes that some students never do this, other students do it constantly. It seems to be one of these bad habits that people get into. So next time you're doing a sky, just challenge yourself. If this is something you do, challenge yourself to not ever put the paper tissue or the rag onto the board, just use your brush. Tip number six is don't leave puddles of paint. So you want to apply your paint evenly without leaving any puddles. Now, all the things that we've spoken about previously, stretching your paper, using a big brush, all of these things are going to help you to avoid that, particularly working quickly. Now, when you finish applying a layer to your sky, hold it up in the light, have a look at it very carefully, make sure there's nowhere that the paint is sitting in a puddle. I guarantee that if you leave it that way, what will happen is you'll get some kind of drying line. So if you've ever wondered how these cauliflowers and blooms and backgrounds occur, 
I have a whole video on it, I will link up the top. But if you've ever wondered how they occur, basically what happens is that wet paint wants to travel into an area that's damp. It's basic physics. The, uh, the paint is trying to spread out across the board. It will travel into areas that are less wet. Now, it won't travel into areas that are dry, but it will creep across into areas that are damp. So when you leave a sky with uneven drying levels and puddles of paint, you're absolutely asking for it to dry and leave drying lines and um, brush strokes and back runs and little hard edges absolutely everywhere. So be very, very careful to apply your paint evenly and quickly and don't leave puddles. And tip number seven leads straight on from that. So once you've applied your layer of paint and had a look and make sure there's no puddles, I want you now to wipe around the edge. So what I mean by that is literally to take a piece of, uh, of kitchen paper or a piece of sponge or rag around the edge of your board. Just sweep around the edge of your board and make sure that there's no water or paint sitting on the edges. Now this can happen, it will happen if you've got um, uh, paper in a block or a pad. The, uh, the, you know, the edges may curl and the, uh, the paint and the water sits along the edge. It even happens with stretched paper. The paint can sit on the edge of the board. It can even creep under the edge of the paper if the tape lips, lifts a little bit. And you can end up with this tiny little bit of water sitting under the tape, sitting at the edge, whatever you've taped your paper down with. And you, you don't realize it's there. And then later on, it creeps back in from the side as your paper's drying and it creeps back in and makes one of those uncomfortable marks. So after you've applied your layer, take a, a rag around the edge of the board. What you want to do is sweep not only on the edge of the board, but you want to sweep actually onto your painting by probably a couple of millimeters, you know, a quarter of an inch. Don't worry if it lifts a little bit of paint off because that would be under a mount, um, a mat if you're in America, that would be under the frame anyway. So don't worry about that. It's really important that you watch those edges because the paint and the water will sit around the edges and creep in later on when you're not looking ruin your painting. Tip number eight is about color choices. Now this applies particularly if you're a beginner. I want you to stay away from ultramarine blue for skies and cobalt blue for skies. Now there are no bad colors and I'm not saying that experienced painters can't get away with using these colors. I myself have used cobalt blue in a sky, perhaps not the most realistic sky. I'll put a picture up for you but it can be done. Um, if you're a very experienced painter, if you've got a good quality of ultramarine paint, then and a fairly light touch then you can get away with doing but if you're a beginner stay away from ultramarine blue i have pretty much banned the students in my art classes from using it in skies because there are multiple problems with it the first problem is it's just not very much like a sky color certainly not here where i live in england if you live in a temperate climate something like canada it's not going to be a great color for the skies where you live i'm not convinced it's a great color for skies anywhere to be honest um, the other problem with the, uh, the ultramarine and cobalt blue as well is they granulate and they don't granulate delicately like a soft color like cerulean they granulate really really heavily now there's a third problem which is that this is exacerbated if you have cheap paints ultramarine is a really expensive um, they use really expensive pigments to make ultramarine which means that if you've got cheaper paints the ultramarine is likely going to be rather mucky and rather murky so if you're a complete beginner, I really strongly suggest that you don't put ultramarine in your skies. If you want to find a better color, I would suggest a cerulean blue, manganese blue. Um, those can be combined or used separately from things like phthalo blue, Prussian blue, even Payne's gray if it's a little bit gray up there. But stay away from these really, really sort of um, purple toned blues that have um, very heavy granulating pigments. So just remember as a rule, if you're a beginner, don't use ultramarine for your skies. I've just seen too many people get into trouble with it. So tip number nine is to consider adding just a touch of pink to the blue in your sky. So we've talked about the colors that we don't want to use, which is the cobalts and the ultramarines. But the advantage that those colors do have is they tend towards the purple end of the spectrum. Whereas once we go to the other end of the spectrum, the cooler blues, the cerulean, the phthalo blue, manganese blue, Prussian blue, beautiful colors, very appropriate for skies, but they can be a little bit cold. So if you're painting, for example, a beautiful English summer day, we have one once a year end of August, then what you want to do is just warm your sky up a little bit. So you want to drop just a touch of pink into the blue to push it towards lilac. Now you don't want to take it far enough that it becomes lilac, so you want to put the tiny, tiniest amount in, but you'll just find that it warms the sky up in quite a beautiful way. 
So the pink that I'm talking about that you should use would be something like a permanent rose. You could also use a quinacridone pink. You could also use opera rose. One of those really sort of blue Barbies type pinks. You don't want to use the, uh, the muddier colours like alizarin crimson or permanent matter rose. Those can be a little bit heavy. I mean, if that's all you've got, that's all you've got. You, know, you can just experiment and try it out. But if you've got one of these nice light pinks, um, the one you're most likely to have in your beginner's set is a permanent rose. It can really, really warm up the blue in your skies and just push it slightly towards lilac and you'll get a much, much softer, more inviting effect. So tip number 10 is to take your sky all the way down to the horizon and to lighten it as it goes. So this is a mistake I see beginners make so often. They've got a horizon line and they've got trees and they try and stop their paint where the trees are. And what happens is you get a hard line where they've tried to go around the trees. And even if they put the trees in afterwards, you end up with trees with no gaps. Now trees have gaps and through those gaps you ought to be able to see the sky. So the easiest way of doing this is just to take the blue and the sky all the way down to the horizon. Now there are exceptions to this rule. You might have some low clouds or something like that. You know, every sky is different. But generally speaking, take the sky all the way down. If you've got something like a big white building in the foreground, of course you're going to have to go around that. But I'm talking about things like foliage, things like fence posts. Now the good thing about green that you get in trees is that it's already made up of blue and yellow. So it's really not going to notice if you take your blue lightly behind it. The other thing you want to do with any kind of sky is always to lighten your sky as it comes down to the horizon. Now the reason for this is because of something called aerial perspective. Now aerial perspective is nothing to do with maths and the sort of 2.3 point, 4 point perspective that I like to torture my students with. It's nothing to do with that. Aerial perspective is just when you, uh, you look into the distance, you will have seen it yourself. It's particularly noticeable if you've got a big long view like you're up some mountains or something like that and you can see everything in the distance looks cooler and softer. And when you look at your watercolour painting, the bit at the top is the bit, if you were outside, you'd be looking above your head, that's the bit that's closest to you. The bit that's down by the horizon, if you were outside, that's the bit that's a long way away. And what aerial perspective is, is all the muck that's floating around in the air. So that might be water vapour, it might be pollution, it might be moisture, and all those particles of pollen and things like that, it's making those things in the distance appear softer and bluer and fainter. So when you lighten your sky as you come down to the horizon, not only does it make it easier for putting things like trees over because you haven't got a lot of paint behind them, but what it does as well is it gives your paintings a sense of distance and you can do it with any sky. Even if you're doing a flat wash sky, you can also get this sense of perspective by using aerial perspective and bringing that down and fading it as it goes and making it nice and light as it gets to the bottom. Now, of course, there are exceptions to every rule. And as I said, I was once over at our local water meadows and I took a photograph that just had this huge bank of black clouds along the horizon because there was a storm coming in. But generally speaking, when you're putting your blue on, fade it out as it comes down to the horizon. So if you've found these sky painting tips useful, don't forget to subscribe because I'm going to have some full sky painting tutorials. As I said earlier, let me know in the comments what sort of sky painting tutorials you would like to see. If you really enjoyed this video, I think you're going to love the one I made about 10 watercolour mistakes and how to fix them even after the paint's dry. I'll put that video up so you can watch it now.